Welcome to Terry Lawson Photography Conversations. It's March 26th, 2014, and we are in the offices of ACI Architecture Incorporated here in Edmonton, Alberta. Today we're going to be talking to architect Tony Brammer about the artistic side of architecture. Tony began his architectural journey 45 years ago in Edinburgh, Scotland. He came to Canada in 1976, where he continues to practice architecture. Over his long career, he has been the visionary inspiration behind the creation of many beautiful buildings throughout Western Canada. His designs not only provide the functional requirements of a building, but they also provide a space with drama, excitement, and a welcoming environment. So join me as I talk with Tony about how he puts art into his architecture. Good morning, Tony. Good morning, and welcome to Conversations. So 45 years as an architect, that's uh, very impressive. And I'm just wondering if you still have the same passion for the job as you did when you began your architectural journey. Well, I think I do. Um, it's changed. I'm not quite as uh, focused on the same things that I had before, but um, now um, people rely on what I know about the project, what I know, not the sort of things you learn in, in, in school, you know, just based on experience of this 45 years that mm -hmm. I've been through. So, um, you know, that's what I can contribute now. Um, and, and still design. I mean, I like to be able to design, and fortunately, at this stage of my career, I can almost pick and choose the bits and pieces I want to do. So, I, I mean, you know, I don't have to get into the trenches so much anymore, but just go in when there's some kind of a problem to solve or there's a design solution that's needed somewhere, that kind of thing. So it's ideal for me right now. Well, and that's perfect because I, I know myself, during my career as an engineer, as you got further and further along in your career, you you became further and further away from what you like to do, and that's engineer or design buildings as an architect. That's right. And to uh, be in the position, as you say, to be able to pick and choose some projects and still design, that must feel pretty good and make it easier to stay in the profession. Yeah, and I think also you get a sort of a level of confidence. And you're immune from a lot of things because of your age. I mean, people uh, <laughs> tend to put up with a lot more guts. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's a nice part about it too. Yeah. So let's go back 45 years, and maybe just describe a little bit about how how you became an architect. Um, it was kind of a, like falling into the ruts in the snow. You know, it was sort of always kind of there. Not as architecture, but more as art, because I spent a lot of time. Just drawing. I, I remember that my parents kept these little notebooks and I had all kinds of drawings in them and I was drawing all the time because we didn't have, you know, iPods and stuff like that then. And uh, my father did a lot of traveling around. He was, uh, after the war, he became a salesman and uh, a lot of opportunities were there for me to accompany him on these trips. He'd go in and see his, his client and I'd stay in the car and I'd draw. You know? wow. So that's what I used to do. And so I, I kind of did that. You know, I sort of built up those skills from a very early age, so, you know, I always had that, you know, sort of uh, ability in art. And uh, that kind of grew into an interest in things that were associated with it. And living close to Europe, because we're in Britain, of course, we, we often went to Italy and France and you know, were exposed to a lot of the architecture there. So that, that intrigued me and how it was built. You know, I was fascinated by the way buildings were put together and, uh, you know, watching them being constructed. With, mm -hmm. Not you know, actively going and standing on the site, but just seeing them as you went by on the bus and that kind of thing. Right. So that sort of started it off, and it was sort of a natural course in a way. I thought about medicine for a while, but I didn't like biology, <laughs> and I was hopeless at chemistry. So that was, uh, you know, I was steered away from that. Yeah. I think it was the money that was appealing there. A friend of mine told me that uh, anything done with passion and finesse, uh, done with love and caring, is an art. Do you think there's any truth to this as far as your architecture is concerned? Uh, in other words, do you consider yourself an artist? Well, you know, I, I think if you think back to the way um, things are done, 
you know, art is, as a, a fine art, is marginalized in our society. People say, well, don't go into that. Go into science. That's where the future is. But if you look around, everything is art. I mean, we live in houses that we like because they're appealing and there's artistry in them. Um, you know, we watch movies, we listen to music, we're inundated, really. Our surroundings are all art. Um, not science. Science is the, the sort of the bolts and nuts and things right. that make it all work. But, um, you know, everything, anything can be art. The Japanese do this. You know, they, they turn everything into an art form. You know, arranging flowers. You know, mm -hmm. Sushi. You, you get a plate <laughs> full of sushi, it's art. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so I, I think, and, you know, on the darker side, you know, there were very artful um, inquisitors during the Spanish Inquisition, you know, that they knew how to, you know, torture with a, a great deal of finesse and skill. I'm not saying that's, you know, something you would want to pursue, but you'll find that art is, can be attributed to anything. Mm -hmm. and, and most people um, know what they like when they see it. You know, they say that, but why do they like it? You know, because the forms are right, the shapes are right, the proportions are correct. So, you know, you translate that into architecture. That's what we try and do. We try and get form and shape and function all to work together. Right. Um, and I think um, when that's done well, it may not be a, you know, one of these iconic buildings, but it could be something that's just useful and nice to work in and, and a pleasant space, you know, which in a way is, is art in its own. Right. And I think that's uh, uh, obviously very important when people are involved um, in your case, uh, a lot of the architecture you do is buildings. Uh, it's important that when that project is completed, it gives people this comfortable place to be and enjoy being in. That's right. Yeah. yeah and, I, and, you know, it's not just architecture. I mean, engineering. You see some fine samples of engineering, you sort of get blown away. Well, by engineering. Some bridges yeah. and, you know, huge spans and yeah. delicate structures. You know, yeah. Well, engineering becomes part of architecture too, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's all part of it. We go yeah. together. Now, as you're uh, putting all of these projects together, I'm just wondering uh, what some of the challenges you encounter from the point of that visualization of a project uh, to its completion. Well, I, I think, you know, that's where um, some of the skill in architecture comes in because when you start to design, um, you begin with a lot of bits of information. You know, it's a, I've always compared it to a jigsaw puzzle. We get all this stuff and we've got to try and arrange it so it makes sense. Mm -hmm. And as you're doing that, you've got to keep in mind, you know, all the different aspects of what you're doing. It's got to work from a, 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 an operational point of view. You've got to be able to walk in and find your way around. Right. So, you know, the direction finding is important. And it's got to work from a constructability point of view, and it's got to work from a, an artistic point of view. It's got to have the right shape and form, and it's got to be within a certain budget envelope. Mm -hmm. So we have all these things to put together, and, and, and that's the interesting part of it. It's quite a challenge. And at the end of it, you've got to squeeze it as much as you can to get <laughs> as much art out of it as you possibly as, as possible. And that, I'm not saying I'm good at that, but some architects are really good at making a cheap building look look just unbelievable. So yeah, well, they obviously the functional aspect of the building is very important, and probably a lot of that budget that you have to complete that project is based on the, its function, right? That's right. So, unfortunately, to a certain degree, that architectural beauty of a building is something that's that must be a challenge uh, to to. Uh, uh, convince an owner that that's an important component of the project. Yeah, sometimes you've got to fight for some elements of the building you know, because you know it'll make the building better because, mm -hmm. I mean, often you can see what it's going to look like. I kind of leave the rest to finishing it to somebody else. <laughs> you know, I've got my message out of it and then you move on to the next one. But it, it, it is art. It, it, there's a, a lot of art in architecture, I think, and uh, they good architecture is the stuff that people see and note. I mean, there's sometimes there's some um, hesitation about accepting it. I mean, you hear about, you know, these buildings where people go, why would you want to spend that money on a, a civic centre when we could have fixed the sewers? Right. Well, right. the sewers will get fixed, you know, <laughs> as part of a regular maintenance budget. But that, you know, that $20 million building that's suddenly grown to $30 million will be there for a long time. 
Mm -hmm. And people forget about what it costs. I mean, I think someone said you rapidly forget the uh, the the, uh, the money you save on a building when the quality <laughs> fails later on. Yeah. But I mean, you get you pay for what you get, and I think um, we should have more iconic buildings in our in our society. Buildings that last, so we don't knock them down in right. 20 years because mm -hmm. we're fed up. Right. You know, so don't build them out of wood frames, you'll build them out of good materials which cost more. And, but they, they contribute something to the environment. Right. You just said something that uh, uh, sort of brought something to mind and that is in the old days uh, you were talking about uh, seeing the building before it's actually constructed and the old days that might take the form of a drawing or uh, a model. But today with technology and the ability to create these 3D models on, on computer, how's that sort of helped you to uh, sort of refine or confirm your, your, your vision? Well, well it is, uh, you know, it's useful. We can see what the building's gonna look like. We can see how it can be modified. More importantly, it's a way of conveying that image to a client exactly. who, who can't see it. Uh, but today, I, I'm not sure that it's quite such a, an important tool other than a visualization one. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people challenge that. You know, they say, you know, check for you know, <laughs> conflicts and things like that. But there's a limitation to that. And, and you're working, the technology starts to take over. Right. And, and that's not what it's about. No. I mean, uh, if... We did some renovations on old buildings, old Strathcona School, for instance. We got the original blueprints and probably about six drawings. And everything, all the detailing, you relied on the skill and artistry of the craftsman who was going to do the work. They knew how to do the stonework, they knew how to do everything, because that was part of the craft. And, you know, that's almost like the Japanese thing. Every little bit that you do, the you know, woodwork and the mm -hmm. exquisite joints they did, um, how they turned it into an art, something to be really proud of. And, uh, you, you know, that is kind of lacking today because we are more focused on the technology of things, you know. It's, uh, it, it gets in the way a great deal. Mm -hmm. From an artistic perspective, what are some of your favorite projects that you've created over the years? Well, I, you know, some of those, um, I, I think one of my favorites is uh, one that you could never see. And when it was under construction, I used to go to the building site and there was a hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And it was, we, we were fortunate enough to be at the time when the city was building all the underground downtown um, LRT stations. And we did the, uh, the base station. It was a, a plug-in station later on because it was never intended to be there, but two of the major really? buildings insisted, so the bay and, and, I, and it, there was a, one of the towers nearby that... Um, wanted to put, donate money, so they each offered to put a million dollars in if this station went there. So went ahead with it. I don't think the city ever got their money, <laughs> but we got our station. <laughs> yeah. And it, it was really interesting because there were a lot of challenges to that. And, um, it, it, you know, we, it was underground, it was uh, subject to a lot of water coming in, and we thought, how do we handle it? So we handled it like a stage set. We let all the junk happen behind, as it was we didn't sort of fight nature, we let it just happen. Mm -hmm. And then we put a, um, a screen in front of it, like, like scenery. And uh, in the end, we, we picked some bright, shiny materials and some durable tiles and uh, built this thing. Um, and it was, was uh, really quite a success. Bridge builders did the, the deck, they refused right. to change it. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, you know, built a parish. Built a parish, yeah. yeah. And, um, it, it, it lasted and it's outlasted all the other stations. It's had minimum repairs and I'd be really proud of that. Yeah. And I go through it today and it still looks as good as it was 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah. And what, uh, what feelings do you, do you get when uh, you go through a state, your station uh, at the bay or you see, uh, you're driving down the road and you see one of your buildings and it's, it's doing what it's supposed to be doing as far as the client is concerned. Yeah. How does that, what does that make you feel? A lot of satisfaction. You know, when they work out, and when clients come and, and tell you that they like the building and you know, how, um, how good it is to work in or how, how it works. With, with the station, um, we had feedback from the city saying they'd spent the least amount of money on that thing, fixing it. It's never leaked. It's never had any major failures. Those kind of things sort of are very gratifying in this job because 
we do deal with the other side of the coin quite a few times where people are not happy with something right. because, you know, it's for various reasons it happens, you know, but um, no, I enjoy buildings. And uh, the other one, um, I think the other building I like a lot that we did was the high school up in Fort McMurray. We had an opportunity on that building to add a theatre. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't just a standard school theatre, they wanted a full, full, fully equipped uh, professional grade theatre. And, and uh, thanks to the oil companies who donated a substantial <laughs> amount of money. I saw the sign on the side <laughs> of the building. <laughs> but we got one. And, uh, and we uh, went all out and put everything in it, you know, changing rooms, green rooms, and even a, a you know, big work, to, work area next to it where they could prepare scenery. And, uh, and the whole thing worked out really well. We went to the opening there and, uh, and it was quite an experience. Tell me about the, uh, the ceiling space above the, above the space. Oh, that, that's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> if you can imagine a trampoline, uh, you know, without any mesh there, you're walking over on nothing on a bunch of wires, and uh, uh, we had a few people who refused to go on it. Is that right? Yeah, yeah because they were very nervous. But, um, you know, once you get over that, it's, it's, it's quite a lot of fun. But just above this, it's a stretch grid of, of uh, high tensile cable that um, is a, forms a net right over the whole building and uh, a whole of the, uh, the, the theatre area. And above that, all the lighting is all the lighting and, and the sound equipment. So it's all easily accessible. The, the reason is access. And um, uh, it's just quite incredible, especially when it's dark and you can look down on what's happening underneath. It's, yeah. it's quite Well, I was, I was up in the one that uh, is over the space in the uh, theatre and the art barns uh, while you were starting that project. and. Uh, it, it's like uh, trying to step out onto that uh, uh, that glass floor at the yeah. CN Tower, right? Yeah. You know, your feet, foot sort of goes out to, to test it before you take that final yeah. step. Yeah, you hope it doesn't bust. <laughs> well, the, you know, what's cool about that, uh, that ceiling space is just the flexibility aspect of it. It must be just mm-hmm. wonderful to work with uh, as far as the, the artists are concerned. It gives them complete access yeah. to everything. So I'm wondering about what you think uh, from your perspective of the the architecture in Edmonton, particularly with the new buildings that are being constructed today. Well, I, I think it's the right direction. Sometimes I think some of the buildings are not quite suited to our winter climate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but we need something that gives us a bit of excitement, you know, just boost things up. I always liked the City Hall. I thought that was a nice building. Well, I think it's wonderful. And, um, and the new art gallery, I think it adds that sort of sculptural aspect to it because our you know architecture is sculpture as well mm-hmm. 3d sculpture yeah no yeah. i mean it's we have to do things in 3d not just and you've got to go walk inside them it's not <laughs> like think. but um uh, uh, but i also think it's unfortunate some of the older buildings have been demolished to make way for some of this stuff i, I mean we keep that we should keep it we go to uh, you go to european cities they, they have buildings that are thousands of years old right well, you know why don't we hang on to some of our heritage. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, I think it's the nature of where we are. A lot of buildings are made of wood and they're easily disposable, so and they don't last as long. But nevertheless, we still have some um, some of the older buildings, a lot of the old schools downtown. Yeah, know. well, it's, it's, uh, it's important to have that. I mean, uh, people need a sense of their past, right? Where, right. where we've come from. And, yeah, exactly. and buildings are a perfect opportunity to, uh, to portray that. Yeah, I, I mean, agree. when we worked together on Old Strathcona School, I mean, that was such a, a, a joyous project to work on, uh, knowing what we were doing and maintaining this wonderful facility and opening up walls and finding surprises that were yeah. from the past. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was wonderful to be involved in that, and especially when it was done and, and, and hearing the, the, uh, the response from the teachers and the students about having this wonderful school. Yeah, the strange thing about that school was the mandate was that it shouldn't look like we'd been there when we finished. Right, because it was historical, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, we, we did the school and you couldn't really tell what the changes were unless you went in and uh, yeah. dug around up in the roof, which we, we opened <laughs> up. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm wondering if you uh, have passions in your life that complement your architecture. Well, about, um, must have been about 15, about 19, 1995 or so, 
I started watercolour painting again. I hadn't done any for the longest time. And I began doing that again, and I really enjoy that. I don't do anywhere near as much as I would like. But, um, you know, I started to develop that, and, uh, and I go to a regular a retreat in Jasper with a bunch of artists that go out there. Mm -hmm. They're sort of a mixture of, of people. There are some professionals and some who are, you know, pretty good amateurs. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you go up there, and, uh, and, and I go up there every year uh, for a week and do that. And that usually is my most intense period of painting. Otherwise, I don't uh, don't do a whole lot of it. I like photography, I really enjoy photography. Um, I spend you know about ninety five percent of my income on equipment. <laughs> <laughs> and today's prices, that's about right. Yeah. <laughs> but I enjoy that tremendously, and I use that to help out with painting too, because I see something and there's not time right. to stab around, take a picture and. You know, and the nice thing about painting, you, if you don't like where something is, you can just get rid of it. Of course, you can do that in photography as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, woodworking and astronomy. Oh, astronomy. The other two things. Mm -hmm. You bought a telescope, and I'm not quite the avid astronomer. Others are, but um, you know, I like going up there and looking at the stars and trying to find planets, and provided it's not too cold, because usually the best viewing is in the winter. Yeah. How about uh, combining your astronomy and your photography if you? Thought of that? I, I thought of it, and I haven't actually done it yet. Uh, you know, Jasper has a dark sky night, and I go up there and watch these guys doing all their stuff. And there's some pretty good photographers out there. Mm -hmm. it's, right, it's kind of fun. Yeah, and uh, forty-five years. Uh, I have to assume that there there might be some thoughts that you know you might retire one of these days. What are you seeing yourself doing when you when you're finished this profession? Well, I don't know. <laughs> it's, you know, it's almost like losing a leg. <laughs> right. You've been doing it for so long and it becomes such a part of you. Exactly. It's very hard to, to leave. Um, and, and that's what I'm finding right now. It's hard to leave and, uh, because I, it, it, well, I mean, it keeps your mind active because there are always mm -hmm. challenges. There's always something new that's coming up. I, I won't be sorry to miss the, the new way, direction that architecture is going. It's become, becoming very competitive, it's becoming highly technical, and I think more so we're losing, it's losing its uh, focus. Mm -hmm. But hopefully the wheel will turn right around again and we'll get back to, to what is the basic of architecture. But um, as far as retirement goes, we plan to travel so that we can do some painting and photography, mm -hmm. and yeah. we've already started on that, because now I'm working part-time, I can take longer holidays and I just keep taking off somewhere and getting pictures and, and then spending uh, about three weeks picking the best ones out of the several thousand we take. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you have some uh, very good passions that, that I think will certainly keep you active and busy, especially with your, uh, your painting. I mean, that's uh, getting a vision out of your, out of your mind and Mm -hmm. physically onto a page, similar to what imagining or seeing a building and yeah. putting that down on paper too. Yeah, well it's, it's not just the uh, finished product, it's the process. Yeah, that's right. Water, watercolor is such a delightful stuff to use. I mean, it's a one-shot deal. That's what I like about it. You can correct it to some extent, but once that pa paint's down, <laughs> you're pretty much committed. And the more you correct it, the worse it gets. You, know, mm -hmm. you, can, you can tell when a, a, a painting's been modified. Right. Not like a photograph. <laughs> yeah. Well, Tony, I want to uh, thank you for sitting down with me today and taking some time out of your day. We'll let you get back to work. Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what I call work, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Tony. Thanks, Terry. You've been listening to Terry Lawson Photography Conversations. Conversations with photographers and those involved in the arts. I hope you can join me for my next conversation.